Hello everyone, uh, good evening and welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. This is our last talk for the session and uh, so my name is Harsha Nikhar and this talk is being presented by Josh Bressers um, and the topic is sorry, my screen turned off. Next Generation Enterprise Security. Um, before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. I would like to thank our sponsors, especially our Diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our Gold sponsor, Prisma Cloud, Blue Cat, Toyota. And it's with their support along with other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are being streamed live and as a courtesy to our speaker and audience, we ask that to for, we ask you to make sure that your cell phones are on silent mode. And if you guys have any question, please use the audience microphone so that YouTube can hear you as well. And uh, with that, let's hear our last talk of the session. Please welcome Josh. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Be careful for some what? What is Tranya? Oh wait, that's the um, um, original Star Trek. It's the one with the little kid, right? If you're offering, I would love one. Thank you. Okay, so for everyone who can't hear what just happened, those of you in internet land, uh, I was offered a drink called Tranya, which is from the Star Trek, the original series, which I am not talking about today, because this is obviously next generation, but let's see. Holy cow, that's strong. Okay. <laughs> All right, next generation enterprise security. This talk, I feel like, will be the high point in every presentation I get from this point forward, because I, I thought of the title before I realized what I got myself into. So let's start with who I am. My name is Josh Bressers. I work for a company called Anchor. We do what we call next generation supply chain analysis. And our open source tools are Sift and Gripe, which some of you may have heard of. It's a SBOM generator and vulnerability scanner. They're very fun. But I also have two podcasts I host. One is called the Open Source Security Podcast, and the other is the Hacker History Podcast. Now the hack, oh, thank goodness. The Hacker History Podcast is a podcast where I invite a guest and I say to them, tell me your hacker story. I'll get to this in just a minute. Uh, I say, tell me your hacker story. And then people tell stories. Everyone has an amazing story to tell. Every guest I've had said, no one wants to hear my story. So please, if any of you would like to be a guest on Hacker History, get in touch. I would absolutely love to hear your stories. It is the most amazing thing I do, and I absolutely love it. So a gentleman just walked in in a Star Trek uniform. Not everyone knows this, but when you submit a talk to B-Sides, there is a text box that says, please request a ridiculous speaker, well, request that, whatever. And I said, I would very much like someone in the front row in a Star Trek uniform to heckle me throughout the talk. And so I totally got it. And you've made my day, sir, so thank you so much. I'm very excited about that. Okay. Now, now, and this, this slide speaks most to you, is many of us have spent our lifetimes watching Star Trek, memorizing lines, memorizing obscure details, and the people in our lives have said, you are wasting your time, none of this is ever going to be useful until today. So this is it, nerds, this is your day to shine. And because of that point, I have a ridiculous number of slides, more than I'm going to get to, and that's on purpose. There will be no questions at the end. If you have questions, either go to the microphone and just talk or yell them out and I'll re repeat them. This is the slides you're looking at right now. They're open to everyone. If you want to use this deck ever in anything, please do. Like you have my permission. Consider this public domain except for all the copyrighted images all over the deck. So, but by all means, it's a fun deck. It was fun to put together. So what did I do? I watched a lot of Star Trek. So I thought of the talk and I thought, okay, how long could this really take? And it turned out it took a really long time. I'm probably three or four years in at this point because you think you can just watch an episode and maybe write down some notes, except you realize you have to watch things again and something happens later and then you go back and you start writing the presentation. You're like, oh, I don't remember exactly what happened. And so this, I, I, I suspect I probably watched three or 400 hours of The Next Generation just to put this talk together. And the question I always get from people is, will you do this for Deep Space Nine or Voyager or something else? Absolutely not. Nope, just heckle. No, no, don't raise your hand. Just heckle. Married? Yes. I'm, the question was, <laughs> no, the question was if I'm married. And yes. Yes. Awesome. Yes, I am married. My, my wife is 
lovely, and I have made her watch a lot of Star Trek. And now she, I basically, there's a rule that when I turn on Star Trek, she leaves the room and we're all cool. That's fine. That's the way it is. And that's okay. I, I understand. So I understand. Why wouldn't you uh, do this for some of the better Star Treks? Why wouldn't I do this for the better Star Treks? Because there aren't better Star Treks. And also, it just takes too long. Like, it was so much more work than I expected. Because at first, I thought, oh, I could do it for other things, but no. And honestly, the other things won't have a good title, right? Next Generation Enterprise Security, come on, that's as good as it gets, right? Do you like Strange New Worlds? Okay. The question was, do I like Strange New Worlds? I am, I find it pleasing up to this point, but I'm going to hold my judgment until the end. Because sometimes they get better, sometimes they get worse. But at the moment, I find it acceptable. So we'll see. Uh, Babylon 5 is very good, but this is to talk about Star Trek. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll just skip this part. Yes. <laughs> All right, so here's what I did. I watched all the Star Trek, and I noted threats and mitigation, right? And, and oh, we'll get to that. I, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is in all over this thing. It's fantastic. But basically, I recognized 178 threats. Uh, 54 of them were insiders. Everything from the robot to the intern to the actual ship itself. Dr. Moriarty, there's a ton of them. And there's nine episodes, like those horrible bottle episodes we all hate, that I couldn't identify anything reasonable as a threat. But there's probably data missing. Here's the part I like. So I put all this data into Elasticsearch, because I'm a data nerd. And this is the, it's hard to read what this is. So the top is just alien. This is where you have a bucket. There's tons of threats in Star Trek that show up one time, and only one time, right? And so that's why that looks like that. But then we've got Romulans second, Klingons third, and Data. The robot is basically the third most dangerous thing in the Star Trek universe. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about him a lot, a lot, a lot. But then the other one I really like is Wesley. Wesley's way down here, right, with the actual ship itself and the Cardassians. So basically, Data and Wesley are by far the two most Sorry. dangerous insider threats. Oh. Would you say for the Kardashians, uh, how do you break that down between Courtney and Chloe and Well Kim? done. Like, well that, done. Uh, Fantastic. Or are they just all lumped under, like, okay. and, and, so, and, and, and how about the Jenners, or are they just lumped together so under Alien? I, I, have, or, or? I have a confession I have to make. I literally don't know any of the names of the Kardashians. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. But I, that's, that's well done, though, sir. Well done. All right, all right. So we'll start out with some quick observations, right? The ship has no authentication, apparently. There's a next slide. We talk about that. There's a reason for it. Uh, no two-factor. Oh, sandboxing doesn't work at all. And Worf, I don't know what Worf's job is. That, that is uh, from Twitter, which it may be gone now, I don't know. But I love that so much. Like, that made my day when I saw it. Well, that, actually, that one's pretty easy. Uh, Worf's job is to be an early detection mechanism. It's, uh, you know, basically, he, he's uh, like a, a human honeypot, or actually a Klingon honeypot. That could be. You're really, um, no, you know, so that's how you know that you have an actual threat, is somebody beats the snot out of Worf. That could be. And they're like, oh, this is a credible threat. We should, might want to do something That could like that. be. That could be. Awesome. OK, so why does the ship have no authentication, right? In the episode, the last episode of the first season, The Neutral Zone, this guy in the blue, he calls the captain at one point, because he's getting annoyed that the captain isn't talking to him, on the computer screen. And then the captain's like, who is this? Why are you talking to me? And then the guy's like, well, if you don't want people using it, you should put authentication on it. And the captain was basically like, we don't need authentication because we're future dwellers who don't need such trivialities. And that was a lie. OK, Wait, so what you're telling me is that we're still going to be running passwords con in the 24th century. Oh, sadly, maybe. Well, no, there just aren't passwords, right? Passwordless. They solved it. They cracked it. It's fine. OK, so now, is this relevant? That's the other thing I thought of. Is this Star Trek's from 1987, right? Like, what is this from 1987? No. <laughs> that's from 1987. Like, that's how old this is, right? <laughs> but, but, but it's very relevant even today in 2023, right? They have a primary focus on running an enterprise and no one knows how to secure it. They have generative, well done, generative AI, right, right, right? Now this one as well, in this episode, the blind man taught the robot to paint, so that's extra cool. <laughs> Virtual reality, right, with Was that paint AI. or hate? I couldn't hear what you know. <laughs> paint, paint, paint. We have social networks. Additive manufacturing, right? 3D printing. They have those fancy replicators, which I would die for. Reusable launch vehicles. Like, it's relevant. Completely relevant. Okay. Now, here's the meat of it. Here's where we start tabletopping our examples, and here's what we're going to talk about. So I'm starting with this one because I'm very proud of the title. 
So for, for Star Trek nerds, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to think about it for a second. So for Star Trek nerds, this episode has a supply chain attack, but it is the most convoluted, ridiculous attack in the history of the supply chain. So the guy there, that's Commander Data for anyone who doesn't know, and the guy next to him is a fellow named Fajo. So Fajo wants to steal Data, and he creates this scenario that will bring Data to him. So there's a planet called, ba and I can't pronounce any of this stuff correctly, so you, like, heckle away, man. So <laughs> there's a planet called Beta Agni 2, which has the water contaminated with something called tricyanate. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tricinate has to be treated with something called hytrium. This is all very real, obviously. And then hytridium. hytridium. Thank you. Thank you. See, this is why the heckling is important. Hytridium, but hytridium can't be transported. So the Enterprise, because... Because plot. Because why not, right? Because your story is bad and no one wants to watch it. That's why. Like, <laughs> so they can't transport it, so they have to move it in a shuttle, and they, of course, decide that the one-of-a-kind android they have on the ship should be the one to move it, because obviously, why not? And so this guy basically knocks Theta out, puts his stuff, like, the things he's made of, his bill of materials, as we would say, bill of materials, and then they put it in the shuttle, shuttle explodes, and the Enterprise is like, oh, no, Data's dead, what are we going to do now? And, like, that's a pretty Someone has set us up the S-bomb. What's that? Someone has set us they up did the S-bomb. up the S-bomb. That's right, they did. Okay, so now here's the other thing I did. Um, this is the MITRE ATT&CK framework under Lessons Learned. So every one of these I apply MITRE ATT&CK framework to. And the data exfiltration over physical medium I thought was like chef's kiss. That was really, really good. And then obviously supply chain compromise. And then I have suggested mitigations for everything. Obviously you could fill your own in if you ever wanted to do something like this. And I have a lot of these, a lot of them to go through. So that's what we're going to do. We'll start at the beginning. I'm not going through them in order, okay? So Encounter at Farpoint. This is the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. It's not very good if you watch it, but that's okay. And they run into a guy named Q. Q is an omnipotent being in the Star Trek universe. He's not the first, he's probably not the last. And my favorite scene from this is when Q is like, kind of giving them a hard time on the ship. Picard says, Everyone should use printouts to communicate so their adversary can't detect what is being sent. And that amuses me to no end. That first of all, it's not the paperless office, so we escape that travesty. But then, like, why would the printouts be any better or worse than a screen? I don't know. Whatever. And then they save the alien. Um, and that's a typical CEO move right there anyway, yeah, right? Just, sure. I don't want to react my email. Just print my email for Yes. Me. Yes. That, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So I couldn't find anything about omnipotent threat actors. I, I couldn't map this one to anything. But they, uh, there are more than one omnipotent threat actors in the Star Trek universe. So for anyone who likes it. Dr. Moriarty. So there are two episodes with this guy in them. He's a holodeck character that becomes self-aware and then takes over the ship. So this is why the holodeck needs sandboxing because it obviously doesn't have any. They let him do it twice because they're not smart people. You think after the first time they do something, anything to solve this, but no, they never solve their problems. They had a really bad prompt engineer. They, they, they had a really bad prompt engineer? That's true, probably. Right? That's true, that's true. <laughs> That's true, and he does technically beat Data, I suppose, if you look at it that way. That's a good point. I love it. I love it. Okay. Now. Now. I mean, putting something in the backlog is doing something. It's just not effective. That's true. They, they never got back to that epic, right? Yeah. Yes. You can put it in my backlog. I'll get to it later. Yes. Okay. What did you say? He did fish him, yes. yes. And, and so I, I actually ran out of... There's, there's so much he does, and his attack is so brilliant. Like, I, I just basically stopped writing them down because I was going through threat framework or attack. But, like, if you look at the way Moriarty actually attacks a ship, it is fascinating. The writers did a good job of detailing, like, good, real attacks and a brilliant threat actor. So this one, like, specifically, I, I truly adore for, like, real honest-to-God security measures, right? And then for my suggested mitigations... Uh, obviously, sandboxing is a big one, but then also I think like in the Star Trek field guide, they, they really need like a, your, so your starship has become self-aware. This happens more than once, right? This is not the first time or the last. <laughs> it will keep happening. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. There's an early episode called Evolution. Wesley is doing a science experiment, and he doesn't clean up after himself, as no children ever do, and then his science experiment becomes life. 
because, yeah, I mean, we've all seen our kids' rooms, right? That, I mean, that's not surprising at all. But then, my favorite part is they're trying to communicate with this unknown life form, and what do they do? They let it take over the robot so they can talk to it. Android, uh, Android it, yes. You're the first one to correct me on that. It, like, I was it, waiting for it. It doesn't sound too different than some of the stories I've heard about Kevin Mitnick, actually, where <laughs> like, oh, let's just, like, maybe we can talk to the guy on the system. You know? It, it kind of, <laughs> it, it definitely feels like that, for sure. So yeah, they, they, they let the life form talk through the Android. And so this one, I, I struggled with the attack framework. Like, is that a hardware addition? If you have the life form, like, take over the robot? I don't know. Maybe it is. You got in Android. Android. Well done. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I think it's actually just a Microsoft update is what that is. It could be. I mean, it, <laughs> that's right. No, it installed too fast. It wasn't from Microsoft. All right. Yes. <laughs> so, like, internal spear phishing? I don't know. You figure you had... A, a, an internal adversary that tricked them into doing something incredibly stupid. Of course, it then squandered its attack status, but that's okay. Uh, is it software deployment? I don't know. But I think fundamentally, like, whatever the Android safety manual is, like, it's not very good. And I think this is definitely something they should cover because it happens again. I mean, all this stuff happens more than once. It's insane. Okay. This one is special for the Arrow. There is an episode called Brothers where... Data suddenly, like, something happens to him. He takes over the ship. That's probably what Worf's email was about to Jordy. He takes over the ship, and he locks the ship with a password, a pretty good password. That's his password on the screen right there. Like, that's not bad, right? That's not, I bet if you type that into your password prompt, it would say, pretty good password, right? And so, like, this is one of the few times we actually see passwords show up in the Star Trek universe, I which think is actually very would say it needs a symbol and maybe uh, a couple of letters. It does a, not have no, some no, lowercase. Long. We all know now. Long is better than symbols. It's fine. And he has <laughs> he has number. He does have. Yes, a, a, but that's a, not a what letter. the prompt would say. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Maybe it depends. It depends which prompt. I won't argue. Okay. Make your password worse <laughs> to comply. Uh, I think that that's too long for decrypt. I think decrypt would actually truncate it. It, okay. It, it, okay. So Jonathan just said it's too long for vcrypt because vcrypt has a maximum of what, like eighty some characters or yeah, something. I think. So. I mean, maybe it's not, but it looks like it's too long for vcrypt. But but now here's a question. So it says like one six three. Does the computer treat that as a word, or does it turn the one into the numeral one? I don't know. You Star Trek heckler. What do you know? <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> just like you. So anyway. Anyway. It's so much longer than the self destruction. I mean, that's true, because those are usually, like, three characters long. Absolutely. And, and I should also add, as part of this, data mimics the captain's voice. So, obviously, this is one of those situations as well, that if you have an Android on your ship, like, maybe voice prompts aren't the answer to your security, because it turns out, like, they can abuse that. So, like, this is where, like, just if they bought everyone fucking YubiKeys, they could solve this problem. You know, like, that would have that totally, it, it'd solve a lot of their problems, honestly, if they did that. Uh, maybe. I mean, they're obviously not Sorry, that. Did you say use the sensors to see who's speaking? Yes. Well, but unfortunately, that violates GDPR, which is why you can't find anybody on the Enterprise uh, with a sensor, is because unless you've consented as a Starfleet right. officer, right. you have to have uh, the sensors ignore that person. Now, on, on that note, if they take off their communicator, they can't find them on the ship, and which is a hilarious plot point, because they can, they can detect an alien spaceship light years away, but they like... Right, they can't find like the intern running around without his communicator on. So you, you that's that's it. that do not track setting. That's right. Maybe <laughs> yeah, that's right. Probably that's what Starfleet, it's like. Starfleet regulations say so you have to honor that. I I, so I get it. Does data have a robust.txt file? That is an You don't want to know where he keeps it. Wait. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. I'm also very proud of this particular description where in a, there's an episode called The Best of Both Worlds. It's two-parter. It's a very good two-parter. For those of us who lived through the next generation, they ended it on a cliffhanger, and we had to wait for the next season to come out before we knew if everything would go back to normal at the end, which it did, thank goodness. But So in this one, the uh, Borg social media network, run by Mark Zuckerberg probably, they, they capture Captain Picard, and they wanted to use him as their spokesperson to convince humanity you should all become Borg. And so this is obviously like for the cool Android right. gadgets. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Right. They got See, those. I'm, cool that, I th I'm pretty sure that is actually a Google project product right there. <laughs> it might be. It might. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Influencer. I like it. Perfect. So in this case, we had you know a competitor poach the senior leadership, and they gain access to their insider knowledge, which 
What do you do in a situation like that? But then this one's a two-parter because they put him back in charge literally the next day. Like they got him back and they're probably like, it's all fine. You're, you can run the ship again. It's all, it's all good, right? <laughs> the yeah. hash checks out. Yeah, it does. It does. It, back. There's no collision here. That's right. In all of Star Trek, in all of Star Trek, it's fine. It's all good. Okay, so what do we do? This one was fun to think about because you've got the board gathering victim organizational information, right? They had to know Captain Picard was the one they wanted because you can't just kidnap any random person off the street. You got to get a good one. They said a good one. <laughs> you probably, I mean, he would have messed it up for him. Like, the board would be gone if Wesley was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, trusted relationships, right? You've captured senior leadership. You're using it to convince them that they should come and help out. I like it. Transferring the data to the cloud account. Everything Picard knows, the Borg knows, which of course never comes up as a plot point ever again in the story, but why not? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I like, I say that they should, they should rotate their credentials when an executive unexpectedly departs the organization, except there are no credentials to rotate, so it's fine. So think about that. No credentials, passwordless, solve that problem, right? Wasn't there the user credentials in the last one? That was just to lock the ship, right? That's right. Yeah, Data used the credentials in the last one to lock the ship. Not, not was ransom generals. Yeah, that's right. Yes, he <laughs> ransomed the ship. Exactly. Yes. I love it. Okay, this is another favorite I have. There's an episode called Birthright. This is a crossover with Deep Space Nine. Yep, yep. And it, the episode itself isn't great, but it has this scene in it where they say they found this thing in a cave on a planet. And then they said, let's turn it on and see what happens. And Data stands directly in front of it when they turn it on. In main engineering. That's right, in main engineering, right next to the warp drive. Exactly. Totally fine. Everything's fine. This is normal. This it turns is out there's a lot more similarities between a USB drive and a warp drive than you think. It, they, apparently, yeah, yeah, I like it. That's perfect, that's perfect. So they hook it up, They Data gets zapped, and he dreams for the first time. This is the episode where Data learns to dream, which does create some interesting other storylines, and, and they're very good. But then, my favorite part is Data's like, I dreamt, and they're, they're talking about it and trying to figure out what to do, and their solution was to do it again later. So they literally zapped the robot twice with a thing they found in a cave. Android, thank you. And I love that. I love that so much, right? <clears throat> so now you've got a hardware addition to the Android, maybe. I don't know. Replication through removable media. I would say that was removable media, yes. Maybe. I don't know. Could be. But I think uh, uh, mitigations, right? In the, in the Star Trek officer manual, I would hope they have a chapter on, like, not turning on things you found in a cave. But they don't. And what's that? Yes, restore from backups. Well, actually, I've got, there's this, I don't know if I'll get to it, because I have a lot of slides, but I've got that in there at once. How many terabytes the backup data? I don't know. That is, that is covered at some point um, in the episode with the Vulcan ambassador. What's that? Giga yes, gigaquads, whatever that is. Giga and you had a question? Comment? I was just saying, yeah, and they should have safety protocols for what should be turned on around the uh, yeah, yes, that's right. Safety protocols for what's turned on around the warp drive. I agree. That seems like it would be I'm good I'm also idea. hearing they might want to migrate to Apple instead of Android. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. All right. This is another good one. There's uh, this. There we go. That's on me. <laughs> okay. So there's an early episode called Contagion. And there is a sister ship to the Enterprise. That's not the Enterprise in the upper picture. That's the Yamato, which looks just like the Enterprise. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I, I'm sorry. The, the oh, Yamato, Yamato they like call the, it, right? Yamato, right? But, but like the, the space battleship Yamato? Is there a space battleship like, Yamato? No, this is know. a Star Blazers thing. I was told this was a Star Trek talk. I yeah, wore the yeah. uniform and everything. Look I'm man. feeling a little Look ridiculous. Look, man. I didn't write this, all right? Okay. All right? All right? <laughs> so anyway, Yamato looks just like the Enterprise. I'm sure that cut down on the model budget. And it... Like, all the, all the systems are freaking out, the Enterprise finds them, and then it explodes. And then the Enterprise starts freaking out. And they downloaded their logs, and it turns out they downloaded some sort of malware when they downloaded the logs from the other ship. I mean, this is just classic air gap, right? I mean, come on. When you're downloading data from another ship that you know has been compromised in some meaningful way, you've got to air gap that stuff. And also, the, the robot catches it, because why not, Android? And I love it. Well done. I appreciate, I appreciate that. <laughs> and then a Romulan ship catches it also. And then... On, every time he says Android, he has to take a shot. Yeah, he's going to be really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> the data comes up a lot. But then, then the solution to fixing everything was to turn it off and turn it back on again. 
which I was like just chef's kiss of it's IT. It's the most realistic thing in the series. I, I agree. I agree. Yes. How do you turn off your life support system in space without dying? How do you turn off your life support system in space? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. They, they, they lose life support multiple times. You've got a couple hours before everyone dies. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> Take shallow breaths. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Okay, lessons learned, right? Exploiting a public-facing application. I don't know. They use a scanner, maybe. I'm not sure. But there's definitely client execution on the ships, right? 100%. And again, air gap environment. Do your analysis. That's how it works. Uh, this episode, as binary code. Yeah, uh, the binars are the weird-looking people. This is a marvelous episode because the binars are fixing the ship because they're binary people or something, and they can do it faster. And they, apparently, we found out at the end, their planet, which is a computer or something, the computer got wiped out by a supernova, I believe, and they needed to restore the backup. And so the binars steal the ship and use the Enterprise as their USB drive to then go and fix the planet that they're from. And they also create some holodeck lady for Captain Riker. <coughs> you look like you want to say something. Like, come on. <laughs> Did I say Captain? Oh, Commander Riker. Ah, interesting. Well done. Good catch. See, this is why I need hecklers at these. And this is why I need a trombone. To there is a trombone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, your, your, your thesis is automatically incorrect because you said this was a good episode, but there's no beard. I didn't say it was good. <laughs> I didn't say it was you good. You said great, but there's no beard. I didn't so say it can't be great. Okay, right, lessons learned. <laughs> Exfiltration over alternative protocols. Is a Starship an alternative protocol? I don't know, maybe. We'll say, we'll say that is. And obviously, like, you got to background check your contractors. Like, you'd think that the Federation would have been aware that the planet those people were from had just, like, collapsed. That, that feels like an important data point, right? Uh, this is another episode that I don't particularly care for, but it has a good lesson at the end for all of us. Wesley saves the day in this episode, which is very rare. This is the episode where he takes his communicator off and they can't find him as he's, like, sneaking around the ship. So Commander Riker brings back a game, and that's what the game looks like. It doesn't look, I'm, for 1980-whatever, that probably looked really cool. But now, like, if I showed that to my kids, they'd be like, Dad, I'm not playing this game. But Commander Riker brings back a game that, like, hooks everyone like a drug, and it gives them mind control, and they have to disable data because apparently it doesn't work on androids. And then Wesley saves the day with Ashley Judd. That is not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and then they fix data, of course, because you have to do that. And this is one of those examples where maybe a knowledgeable insider could help if you have everyone turning evil at your corporation, right? Like, who knows? I don't know. But this one was good. You had fishing, right? You had someone tricked Commander Riker into clicking the button, essentially. You have removable media. They have to put this weird thing on their heads when they play the game. You've got impaired defenses, because the, the, the idea was the Enterprise would be taken over by this game, and then this inferior like, like group of people were going to come in and like take the Enterprise and probably sell it or something. And so obviously there were no defenses because all of the people were zombies. And my mitigation is my favorite part of this slide. And in fact, I moved this one up to here to make sure we got to it, right? Mind control tech, yearly phishing training, happens again, blame the users, right? That's pretty classic phishing training. Well done. All right, here's another title I'm very happy with. So, insertion of malicious data. This episode, there is this thing the ship finds. It's the weird thing in the middle, middle picture. It's in a, like, snowball asteroid thing, comet. I don't know what you call it out in space. And they scan it, and of course, because the scanners are hooked up to everything with super user privileges, when they scan this thing, it takes over the ship, and it starts turning the ship into an ancient temple of some sort. And it, of course, takes data over, because why wouldn't it? That seems very normal. And there are snakes on the ship, which makes, I love that part. <laughs> snake, <laughs> snake jazz. Yes, from Rick and Morty, well done. Okay, okay, so what do we have? Drive-by compromise? Yeah, I agree. Although they kind of went to it. I don't know if that counts as drive-by compromising. But then you've got tainted shared content, right? They scan, they scan the thing, it messes up the ship. And then again, I think this is a good section for, you know, when something takes over the ship, what are we going to do about it? Add it to the manual. Uh, yes? On the previous issue, do you think that segmentation among the enterprise systems was 
I mean, one would hope so. So the, the comment was, would better segmentation have prevented this attack? I would think so. They clearly have no segmentation. They have no privileges for any of the processes running because the things just take the ship over constantly. That is a good point. I do not does, have a slide about that. Does the section about what to do include uh, bringing Samuel L. Jackson onto the spaceship? I, you know, I was thinking that. I was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been epic. I should have I should have put a picture in. But but the the comment prior to the marvelous interruption was there is an episode where some of the characters become children and they can't use the children's computer in the school to look up like ship schematics. But then Guinan saves the day by saying, "Show me a picture of the Enterprise." And then they get their picture of the Enterprise. Chat GPT, that's right. All right, uh, Darmok, this is just a good episode. Anyone who watches Star Trek, you know this episode, it's marvelous. Before uh, you go too much further, would you mind if we just get a photo taken? Because oh, I yeah, have to go totally. annoy other people oh, for a little good, bit. Good. So. Yeah, there's other people requested a guy in a Star Trek uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. You made my day. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're <clears throat> Elon when the Twitter fell. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this episode. Oh my goodness, that's so good. Um, yes. Oh. Yes. Right. Maybe. Maybe. But yes, he points out. They, so this is a species that speaks in metaphors, and the thing they keep saying is Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. But yes, the aliens are using English words to describe something we can't comprehend. They kidnap the captain. They fly the cap or they transport the two captains to the planet surface, and through the power of friendship, they learn to communicate, right? And it's like the real treasure was the friends we made along the way. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how to think of this one. Is this fishing? Like, I don't know. How, how does that work? Obfuscation? Yeah, it could, but is it obfuscation? Because their intent wasn't to obfuscate. It wasn't really attack. But I don't know. It's just good episodes. I left it in. That's fair. That, that's true. That's true, right. The, the comment was you shouldn't have been able to transport them off in the first place. And I went, but, but in Star Trek, they don't raise the shields as like a sign of goodwill. So there is that piece of it. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good mitigation. I just really like the episode, so I'm going to leave it in. All right, time zero. This is one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek. It's a two-parter. I think, I don't know if this one was a season um, jump. I don't remember anymore. It's been too long. But in Time Zero, they find Data's head in San Francisco in a cave, because you find things in caves, obviously. They, they do also turn it on later, but that's part of the story. They, then they end up traveling back in time, and they stop an alien stealing souls, and we find out Mark Twain's a giant asshole. And it's just a good episode all around. And then they, they take Data's old head, and they put it on Data's body, and it's all very confusing, but it works fine, and so everything's cool. So this one... I, I found, I thought about two attack threat, or not threats, um, uh, uh, controls here, right? You've got user execution, where you have Mark Twain is, why did I put user, oh, Mark Twain is, I don't remember why I wrote that down now, I didn't, I didn't write a note for that. Anyway, whatever, but the native API, this one I like from Captain Picard. Captain Picard takes a little iron filing and he like taps out Morse code into Data's head while it's disconnected in a cave in San Francisco, and then Data wakes when they reattach to the head, he wakes up, he's like, oh, don't shoot the, the planet because Captain Picard needs to come back to the future. And it was very amusing. And so anyway, my, the only mitigations I could think of is just like maybe add an asshole column to notable historical figures because Mark Twain, um, he, he was not a nice guy. Uh, Fistful of Datas. This is a great episode in this episode. They hook data up to the computer, because that's a good idea. And then they say it's so he could be a backup in an emergency, except most of the computer emergencies are caused by data, so I don't know why they would do that. And of course, nothing is going to go wrong if you hook the robot up to the computer, right? Yeah. Well done. <clears throat> right, right, nothing could go wrong. And of course, data then corrupts the computer's memory, he takes over the holodeck, and Worf, and Worf's son, and uh, Deanna Troy, who's a ship's counselor, have to basically fight the Clancy gang from the Deadwood story, like Tombstone, the movie, or, well, it's a real story, but... 
it, it is an error in data replication. I put replication through removable media. I think defacement could, could classify here as one of the things. And then firmware corruption, probably. I mean, he corrupted all kinds of stuff on the ship. It wasn't just the holodeck. And then the only thing I can think of is like they just they need a sign or something that's like don't hook the friggin' robot up to the ship. And the USB <laughs> slots. Disabling the USB slots. That's right. I love it. Perfect. Exactly that. Hundred percent. Okay. Uh, the naked now. This is another good one. Everyone gets drunk because why not? It's some alien disease or something. You no, know? they don't ever explain what it is. This one's also from the original series. This is a, a tie together episode. Wesley takes over the ship. This is the first episode where the intern takes over the ship, which I'm very impressed by. His mom, the doctor, fixes everything, and then Wesley saves the day, but he saves the day from the problem he created. Because what happens is there's a picture here where uh, first Wesley, there's Wesley on the big screen, Wesley tells everyone from engineering they should leave, and he'll take care of things. And they're all drunk and stupid, so they do it. I mean, they probably would have done it anyway if they weren't drunk and stupid, because they're still stupid. Yeah. Wesley, what's that? <laughs> yes, yes. Funny water. Yup, yup, yeah, they, it's kind of water, whatever. Anyway, okay, Wesley takes over the ship, right? He's in engineering, he takes over the ship, everyone's mad at him, but then he lets in uh, the guy over there sitting on the floor, who was one of the engineers, and they pull out all the computer chips and their computer which is totally Wesley's fault. And that's why the ship can't move, which is why they're gonna get hit by like the big piece of planet that's flying at the ship, right? So we've got trusted relationships. They trusted Wesley, even though they shouldn't have, and they should know better than to do that. You've got, you can't do a system recovery because all the computer chips are pulled out of the computer. I mean, now obviously that seems ridiculous to us because why would you have individual slots, but whatever. For more corruption, maybe if you pull, like if you remove memory, is that corruption? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. And there's no door to engineering. Just like put a frickin' door on engineering, you know, and don't let the intern in. That's not that hard to do. What's that? Physical access controls. Physical access controls, exactly. The physical access controls in the enterprise are terrible. They're, well, all their security's terrible. If there wasn't, I wouldn't have a good talk to give. So anyway. Uh, Allegiance. This is one where Captain Picard is replaced by an alien duplicate. If someone replaced your CEO with a duplicate, would you know? I'm betting most of us wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> Impede improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, moving on. Um, so this is trusted relationships, obviously. You have an attacker abusing trust, for sure. And, and for mitigations, like I left this one in, because I don't think there's any mitigations for this one. I think it worked as expected. So over the course of all of this happening, the crew figures out something's wrong. And they're like, something's up. Like, something's wrong with the captain. And that's perfect. Like, they, everything works exactly the way it's supposed to work. It's marvelous. <coughs> what do you mean, what? Okay. What? But you don't think it worked as ex well? I mean, this is one of the few ones where they don't completely screw everything up. I mean, they should have cut out a little faster. But well, but then the episode would be too short, and well, the network would tell them you can't do that. I mean, this is, this is how TV writing works. You have to fill that in. So actually, fun fact for all you Star Trek nerds. Uh, Michael Piller is one of the writers on Star Trek. And when they show the people in, like, a turbo lift or walking down a hallway and they, like, have some weird banter, they call that Piller filler. And he apparently was a very good writer at adding, like, just nothing to get that extra, you know, 10 or 25 or 30 seconds they needed for the network. That way they had exactly the right amount of time for the show. I watch a lot of Star Trek stuff. Um, so anyway, all right, data lore. I love this one. Data has an evil twin, right? We should all have evil twins. It's data, not lore. <laughs> data, not lore. And this episode is the one where Picard says, shut up, Wesley, which... I know Will Wheaton doesn't like that, but I think it's hilarious. And I, I, love, I love Wesley Crusher. When I was a kid, he was like totally my hero. I, I was like, Wesley Crusher was it. I'd be Wesley Crusher in a second. But this is a good example where you've got the intern is complaining, saying something's wrong. This isn't Data. This is probably his like lying weird brother. And it was. So I don't know. Is that phishing? Maybe, maybe not. You know, but again, this is kind of where, how do we solve this? Like, uh, if they had passwords, maybe the lore wouldn't have known the passwords. Do Android have biometrics? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> What's that? Mac address. Mac address, right. The Mac address of your Android. Like, who knows what that is? What was that? A private key. Maybe, maybe. That's true. I bet, I bet Androids have lots of private keys. Yes? Problem, you don't have executive buy-in in your plan. That's true. If you don't have executive buy-in. I agree. I agree. Shut up, Wesley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, conundrum. This is the one with backups. So in this one, something happens as all Star Trek episodes begin. 
and everyone wakes up and no one can remember anything. They know how to run the ship. The ship has enough functionality, it can like move and shoot things, but no one knows what's going on, and this weird guy here appears out of nowhere. He's uh, McDuff. He's the second in command all of a sudden, and as viewers, we're like, what's going on? We don't know what's happening. Where did this person come from? And it turns out there's an alien that doesn't have the firepower to wipe out their adversaries, but apparently does have the technology to take over a starship, which seems strange, but whatever. And apparently they pick the Enterprise to take care of. And part of this is the, the logs they can read, say they're on a secret mission and they can't tell anyone what's going on or ask questions or like phone back home to Starfleet and be like, hey, like no one remembers anything. Maybe we shouldn't like go blow this planet up. And their instructions are to go blow a planet up, right? A planet that's like hilariously underpowered compared to them. Okay. So lessons learned, right? I was thinking search open websites and domains. Like how did these people figure out what's up with the Enterprise? I'm impressed. They were able to take over all of the memory. There's the disk is wiped, but only part of it, only part of it. So we have a disk wipe. There's no way to recover the system because the backups don't work apparently. I don't know how that works. Like they should assign their backups or something. Like this is a great example. If they don't have SigStore, like SigStore is not working in the future, obviously. Or maybe like, maybe document something. Have you tried writing it down? Because they, they didn't know who was who on the ship. And so, like, who's the captain? Who's the first officer? Who's who? And eventually they unlock that secret part of the computer. But it's like, you think you could hang up, like, a freaking picture maybe or something on the wall that's like, that's the captain and here's the, like, the, the senior officers, everyone. Isn't that neat? But no, not in Star Trek. Org charts. Org charts. That's right. Yeah, like, maybe, although paperless office, I don't know. Whatever. Doesn't matter. All right, disaster. This one, there is an accident on the ship. And they plug Data's head into the ship to fix it and it works. Data doesn't screw everything up in this episode, but it's very amusing because in this episode, they have to, Data has to stop some like energy field across two walls and he uses his body to do it and then it's only his head and the very realistic special effects of Data's head sitting on a table is then used, like 1987's finest. And so it's an accident, not an attack. I put it in though because it's one example where they hook him up to the ship and it actually works. And I don't know, I feel like this one could be fun to tabletop a disaster in a similar way. Because when we do tabletop exercises as security people, we love to focus on the technical details. We don't always focus on some of the disaster and the recovery aspects of it. And so anyway, that's just my thought. That's like... You'd think so. So, so the question was, how do they have time? Why, why don't they have time for simulations when like everything is constantly broken all the time? I don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah that, that does map to normal life in our I mean, that, that's probably fair. Okay, that's fair. It's easy to pick on that, but you're right. Because in, in many of us say we should do this, and then we never do. And that's basically the lesson of Starfleet, I think. Um, and, and what I'm is in the volume of data supply that all the computing is yeah, right. Yeah, just the head is fine. I don't know. I think it's uh, it's, it's, like just it's called storytelling. I think <laughs> we need it. We need it to move the story along. Uh, this is another good one. There's a does your threat model include the devil, like the literal devil? The devil takes over the Enterprise in the episode Devils Do, but then Captain Picard bests the devil because of course he does. And so this one's interesting because the devil makes the ship disappear, but not really. Only tricks the sensors. And then there's a sham trial where Captain Picard, this is, this is very reminiscent of the original series where like Captain Kirk using his like, like ability to speak and his force of will overcomes the adversary with words alone. But anyway, um, the people are truly morons. So this one I think was really good from the attack perspective because the attacker had to gather information about the planet they were taking over. Because on this planet they had a legend that the devil saved them and would come back someday to claim their prize. And so this person shows up, pretends to be the devil to claim their planet. And then of course all the people on it are like, oh, of course we owe the planet to the devil because I mean, before COVID I would have been like, no way would that happen. But now I'm like, that might happen. So <laughs> just saying, if you look at the way, the way people act, right? You had some resource hijacking in this one. And of course, I think the best precaution would be to carry a fiddle on any devil related away mission. Right? For uh, the young people probably have no idea what that means. Look it up. Uh, cause and effect. This one has a time loop, right? Log for J is what that one kind of feels like. They just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. It's a marvelous episode. 
Uh, I don't think there's a, anything in Miter Attack for time loops, and there's no mitigations. It's just a really good episode, so I left it in. Uh, Night Terrors, no one could dream. I've got one minute, so I'm going to hurry up. And there's more slides than this. There's like 77, we're on slide 64. But there's a link at the beginning, so you too can play along at home later. But anyway, Night Terrors, no one could dream. They totally denied the service to all the people on the ship. Then they all kind of went crazy. Because you had an alien species actively scanning the dream world or whatever, and they were looking for someone to help them. They did find it, and everything went back to normal at the end, so it worked out well. But, and then Data's day is where I'll end. This is one where Data says how much capacity he has, but I don't remember what it is. And it's got, uh, it's a story about, about these two people getting married, the O'Briens. Data gives away the bride. There's dancing, and there's a Vulcan ambassador who's actually a Romulan, haha. <laughs> That's how it works, and I think this is a good example of when there is an accident, you need to investigate it properly, because they kind of didn't do a good job the first time, and then they went back later and like, oh, we missed a bunch of stuff, we get it now, and that's when the Ramis are like, oh, haha, -ha, it was one of us. All right, I'm out of time, there's a few more slides, don't sweat it, look the presentation up on the internet, you two can look at my, my deck, change it, have fun with it, this has been a treat, thank you so much, everyone, it's been a blast. <laughs>